This is the Business Storytelling Show with Christoph Trapp. Name a top 20 storytelling podcast and a top 5% podcast globally. Christoph chats with thought leaders and experts to share tips and tricks that can help you tell your company's stories better to drive business results. Available wherever you listen to podcasts, live streamed on major social media channels, and part of the DB&A television network, Available on most U.S. television sets and streaming on Roku and Amazon Fire. Here's Christoph with today's episode. Let's go. That's right, my friends, business storytellers, let's go. We're going to talk about SEO today, and I want to jump right in. One of my favorite topics, and I typically don't show you guys the book right here at the beginning, but this one, it's a, it's a good one, and I don't just say that because... The author is today's guest, but so many different things to challenge my thinking while I was reading through it on the Kindle, got it the other day about linking and, and, and how to go about SEO, how to try to rank, how to not try to rank, all these different things. Um, and, you know, it's definitely impacted my thinking already. Product, let SEO, you can see the link um, in the show notes. And also if you're watching on Amazon Live, it is the featured item on in the carousel. Today's guest, Eli Schwartz, is joining me. I actually didn't ask him from where, from his studio somewhere in the world. Eli, thanks for joining us. Really glad to have you on the show today. Great to be here joining you from Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas, awesome. Um, I used to spend a lot of time in Texas, in Dallas, and I definitely enjoyed it. Everything is bigger in Texas, including the meals, so. Um, yeah. Awesome. Gl- glad you could join us today. So the book, I don't say that to anybody that comes on here. I really enjoy it so far. I think I got a, a few pages left to go, maybe 20% or something like that. But tell us about product-led SEO. What is it? Why do people, why should they care? And you know, why did you start the book? There's three questions for you. So the, the answer to why I started the book, I think that's the most relevant. I started the book for because I for two motivations. One was I had an amazing team. I spent a number of years at SurveyMonkey, was able to, to grow organic traffic from practically nothing into driving three quarters of global revenue, you know, for a public company. That's that's pretty good. And then, you know, I had this great team and we they we would work through challenges as the company got bigger and they would always ask me these questions like, how do I present this to an executive or how do we get the content team to move along with this? And the engineering team is giving us this pushback and I'd give them these really detailed responses and they would be like, you should write it down. So I started, I started writing it down and, you know, they be, these things became very helpful and I started publishing some of them as blog posts. And then I, you know, when I, I left SurveyMonkey and started consulting and working with some really amazing companies and talking to leaders about the way they should approach SEO, the exact, like they were trying to do it the wrong way, which I, I talk about in the book and I'll explain in a second what the wrong way is. And they would say, where can I read more about this? And I would say, well, there's podcasts, there's blogs, but there's no book I could point them to. So that was really the, the impetus to really start writing the book. And as far as what is product-led SEO, so it's easier to understand when you think of what the opposite of product-led SEO is, which is content-led SEO. So content-led SEO is the way most people are going to do SEO. They're going to go on a keyword research tool, any of them, you know, find the keyword related to the space they're in, and then start pumping out content with those keywords in without a real thought of like, what happens if I don't rank on that keyword or what happens if I do rank on that keyword? So product-led SEO is my approach to really thinking about SEO as a product. We're producing content because it ties into general strategy. There's an actual user of this content who's not just going to search and click on it, but they're going to consume this content for a purpose that's beneficial for the broader KPIs Company. So when we're producing content, it's not just one-off blog posts with my goal of producing 10 pieces of content a month. It's I'm producing something as a product, an experience, something that's beneficial for users. And I have an example of my book of like, you know, how to do it from a, from a healthcare example, but really like, why should users consume the content? And when you don't have an answer to why users should, should consume the content, you don't do SEO. It's definitely an interesting discussion. I don't think we're too far off from each other here. Certainly, I'm a content person, a content creator, content marketer. And and I would probably, before I read your book, would would probably say, yeah, I'm more in the content-led SEO side of things. But some trigger words that you mentioned there, one-off blog posts. Oh my God, don't get me started. Guys, I grew up as a journalist. And what do journalists do? 
Every year, we write the same stupid weather story because you know why? Because we have to create new content. As content strategists, content marketers, you don't always have to create new content. If I already have an article on whatever topic, just update that article, especially if it's already performing well. So definitely no disagreement from you there. So the whole one-off strategy kind of thing needs to stop, quite frankly, but but I've said that for, for a while. Now, the examples you gave, SurveyMonkey, what, what, the, what I thought was super interesting, the example of how everything started getting pushed down or the results, the, the clicks weren't as relevant anymore. Talk about that a little bit. Super interesting how, how the searcher intent shifted, right, basically from what uh, was working up to that point. Yeah, absolutely. And just to follow up on that piece you said about being a journalist. So for many businesses out there, they're not media properties. So when a SaaS business starts producing a blog as if they're media, so great, they're, the KPI becomes reading. And I worked with a company from a consulting standpoint. They spent millions of dollars on a blog that was essentially like just content marketing. It was just content. They were never going to generate any KPI from this. They were telling stories. People consume the stories, but they weren't going to go anywhere. And now going to the answer about like what happened in SurveyMonkey. So we were not a media business. We were not in the business of creating content for people to read content. And then the KPI being read a piece of content and go to the next page and read another piece of content. We needed to sell a product. We needed people to, to try the product. And what happened there was that we were ranking on the keyword survey. So when I joined the company, there were only about four keywords we were ranking on all in English. One of those four was survey and surveys. We stopped ranking on the keyword surveys because Google determined that when someone searched for the keyword surveys, they were actually looking to take a survey. And there, you know, for anybody that, that knows about this business, there are a lot of shady places on the internet that will pay you to give your opinions and they'll pay you with points. You won't even get actual money. So Google determined right or wrong, but that was the intent behind that. And if SurveyMonkey were to continue investing and trying to rank on that word survey, when you thought about all the tactics and metrics that go into where you should rank, we were obviously higher better, and better than all those other sites. We had backlinks from the White House. We had backlinks from every media property, every government organization, almost in the entire world. Yet we were beaten by businesses of dubious character based in dubious countries, ripping customers off. So that's the intent. We were not going to continue drilling and, and getting links and creating more content on a keyword we were just never going to rank on. We needed to generate business and generate conversions and signups from that. So that that's where I think SEO, you really want to have the focus on SEO. What's the point? What are you doing with all of this? I think that's always the key question. What's the point in anything we're doing? And I think sometimes people people miss that. What, the other thing that crossed my mind when you were talking about the whole survey monkey thing is B2B is hard enough as it is. And now we're competing to an extent with B2C searches, right? Because that's really what that is, a B2C search, somebody trying to take a survey as opposed to somebody um, buying a survey platform or subscribing or whatever it might be. Very interesting. So now we want to automate a lot of different things, right? I mean, think about what I'm doing here. I mean, I got all these things go and most everything is automated except us talking to each other, you know, and and uh, I use other tools as well, coming up with stories and whatnot. But how about how about the role of the human? I know you talk about that a little bit. Is I mean, there's have you seen that push? People try to automate everything, or am I just dreaming about that? Oh yeah, they're trying to automate everything. And I, I think you just underscored that with when you said what you're automating and what you can't automate. We're talking to each other. I don't think you would have any podcast listeners. No one would subscribe to a live stream if two robots talk to each other. It's not an interesting conversation. It, it's predictable. The robots predicted what they were going to say. You know, when you have a human conversation, there's there's human pushback, there's human emotion, there's experiences and stories that no robot can really do. And I think when it comes to SEO, yes, you can automate how to optimize your title tag. You can optimize your internal linking. You can optimize the products you're going to feature. You can optimize even the content you could create, but you can't optimize the stories. You can't optimize the content with, with robots. And that's where I think when you have this whole idea of like, well, SEO can be done by robots because Google's a robot. Great. So you've optimized for the robot, but when a user clicks on it and a user reads a robot written story, it can't trigger the emotion we want, which is hopefully <clears throat> by 
click, I don't know, whatever it is, you can't trigger emotion with robots. And if you can, like, we're just living in a robotic world where like, it's the matrix where we're sitting there and robots go out and live life for us and go and eat for us. Like, you know, you, you search, like, I want something to eat for lunch. And you created a robot written piece of content about what's going to taste good, but ultimately a human's going to eat that. So I think that's the role of humans. Like you need that human creativity, the human drive, the human emotion to really connect from the final part of that customer journey. You can automate all the parts that are, you know, robot to robot, but not that final part that drives the conversion. Yeah, there has to be a strategy. Now, what's interesting, we had Casey Shields on the show. He's the VP of marketing at Narrative Science. And he talked about, and, and I reached out to them. They did not reach out to me. And um, they, they create game stories in Game Changer, right? Like the Game Changer app for, for youth sports. And it's pretty well written. And I joked, I said, you know, 20 years ago, the newspaper would pay me 50 bucks to write that same story. Like not for 14U or 13U, but, you know, so there is a place on where certain machines can do some things. But here's the one thing that um, their tool cannot do. It doesn't always get the context quite right. And it doesn't get the quotes. So you know what I mean? So if something happens, and you go to the picture, and you say, um, okay, what happened there? Like, it it never will get that right. And that's a big part of a game story. I mean, think about it. Why? Why do we have the debate in tennis? You know, why people need to should be going to the news conferences? Um, very interesting. But how do we dive? Let's dive a little deeper in the, the how do you actually implement product led SEO? So when you, you know, in a traditional content strategy it makes a lot of sense to me, like I know how to do that, and whatnot. And, and, and I hear you, what's the plan if you don't rank? Well, my plan is, I don't even write it if I don't think I can rank for it. And I did have a case like that yesterday, I thought there's no way I'm ever going to rank for this ever. No way I can't compete. So what's how do we start? Like, how do we wrap our head around that? So because I believe in approaching it as a from a product standpoint, whenever you create a product, whether, whether you're creating a, uh, you know, a Peloton bike, whether you're creating a new app, you need to know that you have product market fit. So in order to know you have product market fit, you can't just be a genius sitting in your basement. You actually have to go and talk to customers. You have to talk to the potential users. Would you buy a bike for $1,000 that sits in your house and you watch other people and encourage you to do that from your house? Would you download this app and would you pay for it? You need to have answers to those questions. So I think from an SEO standpoint, you need to talk to users and say, what is it that you might be looking for? What are the questions that my company or my business can answer for you, uniquely answer for you, because I have this unique uh, value add that I'm adding to it. And in my book, I recommend thinking about things like going to Reddit and Quora. There's so much content that's like locked away in essentially conversations. So try to extract the conversations from what are people looking for? So whatever it is, like um, the example I used in my book was, was telehealth, like how you can go and try to answer questions from a basic level on a search standpoint, how might someone not diagnose themselves, but understand whether they need to go see a doctor because a lot of people are doing that anyways. So it's not about writing blog posts towards content. It's writing blog posts or writing a series of content that answers a series of questions based on the questions existing, not based on the keyword research volume for it. So it's going to be different for every business. And that's what I think is an important part of SEO is you have to think about SEO as a channel for your business in the context of acquisition for acquiring new customers, not in the context of, well, I'm doing all these other things to acquire customers because this is what my business does. But for SEO, I'm going to go do totally something different. I'm just going to focus on keywords. So I think SEO has to be in the context of what is it that you go out and talk to customers about? Your SEO should be saying the same thing. What is it our business is in the unique position to provide? Your SEO should be doing the exact same thing. And if you can have a scalable product around that, like Zillow is an example, I use my book or TripAdvisor, then create that. If you don't, then don't create it or maybe don't even do SEO. Yeah, I found those examples quite interesting. Um, Zillow and what was another one? Amazon, I guess. And there was another one in there. TripAdvisor. Um, TripAdvisor, super interesting because they always show up. Like if I'm searching for an address, you know, on on anything, Zillow shows up. You know, it's it's just and it's that's very different. Um, I want to circle back to the whole customer uh, comment in a minute, but first, uh, Trey on Amazon says this is very interesting. I was just research researching this yesterday. Really appreciate your comment, Trey. Thanks for joining us on Amazon Live. Um, so interestingly. Eli, I am sitting 
in my basement. I know it doesn't look like that. It's all smokes and mirrors. But I, I'm with you. People, we need to talk to our customers. So why, like, why do we have to keep saying that? Why are people not doing it? Why are people sitting in their in their basement and they're just make you know uh, making up ideas without that input? Why why is that a thing? So I love the SEO industry and I love so many people in the SEO industry, but there's some people that help perpetuate the myth of Google as a black box. So whereas executives know, here's exactly what I'm going to do from a branding standpoint. Here's what I'm going to do from an advertising standpoint. You don't spend money and not expect an ROI or you know some sort of customer outcome from it. But somehow when it comes to SEO, they're like, well, I don't understand this thing. So I'm going to go get an agency and they're just going to do it. And that's why I wrote my book because I want executives and leaders and anyone curious about SEO to understand that this is not a black box. I want to demystify this and understand how to approach it and how to think about SEO strategically. It's just another channel. And you have to understand whether this channel even makes sense to you. You have to understand whether there are keywords in your space or they're not keywords in your space and not just pay some sort of monthly retainer either to an agency or a monthly salary to an employee just because you have to do it. You don't have to do SEO. If SEO makes sense for your business and it does make sense for probably most businesses out there, do it. It, do it right and do it in a way that will strategically impact your bottom line. But if it doesn't, don't do it. An example of a business that I don't think it makes sense for is a lot of local businesses. They should do SEO from the standpoint of let me optimize Google my business, let me optimize a very basic web page. But I know that when I've looked for home services and I find a plumber and they have a horrifically looking website and it's pumped full of keywords. Those dollars would have been better spent on buying more tools or doing more paid advertising, doing Facebook, doing Google. They shouldn't be putting money in SEO. Like why I'm not getting a plumber because they're number one for plumber in my area. The same goes for, for restaurants. You don't need an exquisite website that goes through all of the ingredients you use. You maybe need a menu and your opening hours and a phone number and directions on how to get there. So SEO has to be thought of in the context of how much it's going to drive for your business. And that's what I want everyone to understand is that, that this is a channel like any other channel. It's not a check the box channel. Check the box. That's definitely always something uh, everybody's talking about. Trey says here on uh, Amazon, I'm just trying to get started with SEO. I think I'm late to the game, so to speak. But I mean, late or early, there's no better time to start than now, right? Yeah, there, there is no late. It's your business. And if you and this is something I really touch on the book. It's not about chasing competitors. You're late to the game if you're trying to imitate your competitors and be just like them and get the same content and the same backlinks. Trey, you're in business for a reason. Be what your business is and do the SEO that makes sense for your business. Don't copy anybody, be you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So um, your comment on SEO might not be the right channel for you. Maybe we can dive into that a little bit. And I um, I produced the Real Talk, the Customer Insights show with Jen Vogel and Rand Fishkin was on that show recently. And he said, you know, SparkToro, I launched SparkToro. It's for the it's something I couldn't solve with Moz because it's basically for companies where nobody is searching for anything they're doing yet. So he's trying to reach influencers. But how do you know where your company fits? How do you know whether it's SEO is the right strategy or it's not? Like, what, what what's your tip when it comes to that? Talking to customers. So I, I mean, I, I had an experience where I interviewed with uh, one of the top three companies. I won't say which one it is that does cloud services. So there are only three large companies and talking to billions of dollars that do this in the United States. And they were really, <laughs> really focused on doing SEO, which made no sense to me. No one makes a million to a hundred million dollar purchase because one of those three companies is ranked number one on Google. And if they do find some sort of white paper on Google for one of those three companies, they're quickly going to learn about the other three companies and go through a bake off who has the best security, who has the best pricing, who has the best support, all that. So SEO is not a fit talking to customers. No CIO from a company is going to, no CIO from Netflix is going to say, well, we decided to use Amazon because it was number one on Google and that was pretty much it. After that, we just whipped out the credit card and paid, right? So like, you have to talk to customers and understand does SEO fit in that customer journey or not? And if it doesn't fit in that customer journey, invest in it and accordingly, not saying ignore it, but maybe don't pour a ton of money into it. And, you know, uh, on the topic of, of what you said, Rand Fishkin said, and I, I did not listen to that podcast yet, and I, I'm going to listen to it immediately because it sounds interesting. But I worked with a company, they invented a term in their space, 
And I was consulting with them and they were said, well, we're, we have six positions on our term that we invented. We have six positions out of the top 10 on Google when you search for it. What can we do to do more? I'm like, no one's searching for your term. You have six <laughs> positions. You're not going to create, you know, that this is an impression problem, not a click problem. So if no one's searching for you, why would you continue to pour money into that channel? Put that money somewhere else. Hire more employees. I don't know. Once people are back in the office, get better food, do something like that. But don't continue to invest in a SEO channel that's not going to drive ROI for you. It's very true. A couple quick shout outs here. Um, usually I don't get to bring this one up. This is my day job, voxpobme.com. I don't think it's come up before on a show on, on, until, uh, except the one where uh, Jen Vogel, the VP of marketing was on the show. But if you don't want, do want to talk to your customers, this is a video survey platform where you can send questions to your customers and they can send you video responses back. Much easier than writing it out. Just mention that here. And then here's our typical one. If you're wondering, um, why Eli and I look so great. I mean, other than we do look great, but how do we get all this stuff to be flying around? Switcherstudio.com is the platform I use directly on my iPad to produce the show. Huge, huge fan. I don't think I could pull it off without their help. Trap One gets you the first month off. Give them a try if you like. They also got like seven-day passes or, or something like that. Now, you also talk about other things, which is interesting to me. Um, link building. I probably get, I get so many emails a day. People want me to link to them and people want, you know, whatever. And it's just, um, it, it's kind of a hassle. And I always, I always live by the, by the thought, you know, people will link to me if I have something to say. And that's kind of, you seem to talk about that in your book a little bit too. You know, um, all this artificial link building will not help long-term. Yeah. And I think this is the thing is like, I've been doing SEO for a really, really long time. And it's funny, the, the conversations around link building haven't changed that much. And Google has changed so much. Like, you know, I noticed I had a missed call last night from my, uh, you know, I moved from the Bay Area. So my previous congressional representative, she had tried calling me with a robocall on my Android phone, picked it up without telling me, figured out it was a robocall, told her not to call me again and mark it as spam. So a company, and this is Google, a company that can figure that out, they can tell that a link about cryptocurrency in a blog about pets is not a fit. They can tell that a writer on a maybe authoritative magazine is looking out to shady sites all the time. They know so much. So it's not the same as, well, let's look at this from a binary standpoint. Do they have good domain authority? Do they not? Is the link followed? Is the link not? This is really about the context of things. Like early on, in my SEO career, I was working in the automotive space on automotive content and we competed. Unfortunately, we had to compete against sites like uh, CNN and the New York Times who launched portals that allowed you to compare cars. But now that wouldn't happen anymore. You've seen that Google has cut all these off. Like CNN doesn't have these automotive portals anymore because Google says, CNN, you stick to the news. If you want to go and create automotive portals, you have to put in as much effort as KBB and Edmonds. You know, US News, you have put in as much effort as KBB and Edmonds, you get to have an automotive portal. So you don't have any of these more shopping comparison sites hanging off of subdomains from the New York Times and all these other websites because it's about context. Google can see that. So links are the same thing. If the link doesn't make sense, Google has a lot of things they could look at to decide whether that link is valuable or not. And they don't need to penalize you anymore. They could just ignore it from the count. So what I would say is, I don't know what links matter or not. I just you know, have a healthy trust of Google figuring these things out and wouldn't invest resources in chasing them if they're probably going to discount them anyways. And it's so time consuming. I, don't, I personally don't see the return in effort, quite frankly, on... Um, on, on, on doing that really quickly. We got one question here um, before you run out of time um, on Amazon. What's the number one advice you would give? Uh, would you give somebody that's new in the industry, Eli? But, but first, before you get there, Greg Gifford was on the show a while back and we talked about small businesses and how, even if you don't have a website, at least do Google my business. Um, and I agree. There's a lot of crappy businesses, uh, business websites out there for local businesses. Would you agree with that? At the very least, have a strong presence on Google My Business, even if you don't have a website? I would agree with that and say don't even have a website. Because if you have a website, but it's a <clears throat> bad website, 
then you lose out. Google My Business is a great website and we use it for so many things. We use it for local and I love everything Greg says. And Greg, one of his best piece of advice that Greg gives is that go answer your questions on Google My Business. If people ask a question and you don't give a response or you give a stupid response or you let someone else respond, that's your loss. And you know, there are shady people out there that will mark your business as closed. Like go defend that. Don't build a bad website that's slow and gives user a bad experience. If you are going to build a website, build a great website. But Google My Business, especially for local businesses, that's the way we do things. And what I love about that discussion too is I'm a content guy. I'm going to build a website, the end. But if I own a plumbing business and I don't, you know, whatever, I'm not a content person, like, I don't, why do I need a website? You know, if I at the very least can make Google My Business work. So it's just... I think people look for all the, this is the answer for every potential situation that could come up, you know, and please do exactly what everybody says. Um, or do and, Yelp. And I would say it's, unfortunately, Yelp is also a platform that dominates that space. Yelp. So invest in your Yelp, invest in your Google My Business. You can't hate on Yelp. They own it. It may be extortionist. It may not be, but like, that's where people are making decisions. Don't say, well, I, I you know, I don't like Google. I don't like Yelp. I'm going to make my own website and it's going to be bad. Like, you know, i, I was looking for a mover. I moved from California to Texas, like seeing terrible websites with like movers with big muscles. Like, you know, I would have been better off looking at Yelp and I did make a decision from Yelp and saying here, they showed up on time. Their prices were what they said instead of like those pictures on, you know, their bad looking websites. Fantastic advice. Um, check out Eli's book um, very briefly, 20 seconds or so. Eli, what's your number one advice to new people in the industry? I would say do your own SEO, create a site, start looking at your Google search console. I guarantee you, if you launch a site, you will get traffic. You'll be on page 90 of search results, but you will get impressions and you'll learn something. That's how I started and like made me curious and you can start from there. You know, that's, that's what I would do. Before you even read my book, go register a website and get Google search console. In my book, Content Performance Culture, I call that the accidental SEO strategy because every once in a while you'll write something and it'll take off and you don't know why and you don't know anything, but you started. Eli, it was a great read. Uh, it was great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for making the time. Great to be here. Thank you, Christoph. This is the Business Storytelling Show with Christoph Trapp. Name a top 20... That's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. Please rate and review our show on your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to share this episode with your networks. We appreciate you. Until next time, let the best stories win.